This is my alter ego right here. It's so nice to meet your alter ego. <laughs> she's very outgoing and oh, she's just adorable and just cuteness in a little being. Yes, and very, very, very intelligent. <laughs> Yay. And so everyone, welcome to the INFP live Q&A with Nancy. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Joyce. This is such a pleasure having you have me to interview. I was completely taken by surprise the other day when you asked me. Um, boy, I think of I think of myself as having maybe a cat with nine lives, so that each segment of my life calls out a different personality in a way, uh, and and I think that that you know is because the extrovert is not the real me it is what i you know need to live out the inf the introverted feeling part of me and the introverted part of me you know adapts to the external roles that i'm in um the the you know what the inner part of me is looking for from those outer outer uh outer expectations for instance i worked for the state for almost 30 years and the first 15 years were just a huge developing thing it was just the utmost freedom i um uh got to pick my team i was uh, a lead uh, lead team for the Department of Corrections in their uh, prison factories. So here's me, you know, <laughs> an INFP, and I'm teaching people how to do um, quality control in, in factories. And the, te the teams were managers of the factories. And um, in the Department of Corrections, whatever role you have as leader, it doesn't matter what your classification is, you're the leader. So that was very empowering, very, very empowering. And teamwork, of course, would be, and communication would be on the top of my list anyway. I majored in psychology. Um, and uh, I was able to do the MBTI throughout my career. Um, I was exposed to it pretty early in my career. Um, through a tiny chapter in Sacramento that never became part of AT APT. And um, that was, it was really fun. Um, I think that I'm happiest when I'm having fun, and I'm having fun when I'm doing something new and challenging, but that has a lot of depth. I learned early on that if something didn't have a lot of depth, I wouldn't be able to put my time on it because it, it would it would level out at long before you know it would appeal to that need for deep challenge. And definitely, the state was a challenge for me in that way, much more rule oriented and uh, stuff like that. But what it did bring out from me were, were analytical skills, the ability to put those skills on paper. And writing has always been my uh, very strong point. I started, started as a teenager up in the den. The den was about the size of my desktop with a typewriter. And I don't know if you, I can still hear that you know that bang 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 having to go down four inches for every for every letter and I started writing stories but my mom came across something I had written and she took it personally and so I just had to stop that was another thing though and I bet I and other INFPs are good at this too I learned that if I put something in plain sight it wouldn't be discovered. So I would put, you know, books like Gone with the Wind, which was a terrible, terrible book in those, you know, I had a nun banging on the table and, and you know, screamed to the whole class, this is a bad book. 
course, I took it home and read it cover to cover. But if I put it into a bookshelf, nobody would notice it. And uh, so as a child, I was quite a leader. Um, uh, and that's interesting to me. And when I look back, I go, you know, how does that fit? I don't know. But um, Elizabeth Myers Briggs um, says, and I love this, she, uh, it became kind of a cartoon, that for the introvert, um, the introvert stays in the tent and then sends out her auxiliary to get just, just get a bunch of information, bring it back, let me decide, to bring it all back. And um, so, you know, those things that you do on the outside are not necessarily going to be valued by the inner, inner processor. And by the way, John Beebe really, really helped me when he said that INFPs are processing all the time and so what I've noticed more recently I don't know if I'm going beyond your question here but what I've noticed recently and I'm teaching myself is that while I'm processing my face is relatively inert and I see that in other INFPs now that we're on Zoom people that I know who are INFPs and they may sit way back with their eyes down the whole, uh, the whole presentation. Um, and that can be interpreted by others as, you know, that you aren't, you, you are not going along with what they're saying. And sometimes you're not, but, um, uh, and so, I also remember reading in a book that more focused on portraits of INFPs that, you know, the worst thing that could happen to you would be to have an INFP love you. In other words, they're just so incapable of expressing that love. And I have three children I, I really adore. And so, a lot of my adult life has been spent, you know, communicate. I think my dog's resting on the keyboard. Um, is learning that, and that I have to use engage that uh, auxiliary function to um, to get it, to get across, you know, my my real feelings, and. Um, Going from that to, you know, the experience of my underside, which is, you know, the diamond or the demon, that eighth function attitude, which for me is introverted thinking. I, um, I only actually have connected with it and, and realized that I, I wouldn't go, I mean, the eighth function, but I would but realizing that I was kind of captured it was like I was in a cell where there was no other reality. And the, the feeling function is absolutely frozen. There is no, uh, you know, I cannot, no matter what that other person might mean to me or how my, they might get across their, 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 you know, their emotions or what, you know, they didn't really do. Um, that is impervious. And so I kind of liked that model of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde because really Dr. Jekyll doesn't know about Dr. Hyde and Dr. Hyde doesn't know about Dr. Jekyll. And I think that, you know, when people are talking about, you know, when they get in the grip and stuff like that, they're in, I think I really have been able to, because of the love I share for my daughter, who is an ESTP, because of her and the love overcame the barrier that completely shut off, you know. And, re you know, I remember one time she was, tears were running down her face and she was asking me to forgive her for a very small thing 
again, she probably watched my face and, you know, concluded that it was, but I was way back there somewhere. And finally she said, I've said, I'm sorry. Are you going to keep me up here waiting for your uh, forgiveness? And it clicked to that, you know, other side of me. And that made me see how when I'm in that mode, I don't know how, how to get out of, out of it. Or, and I'm, I feel justified being there. And I justify it. And I haven't really, even, you know, when I was uh, uh, trying to communicate with somebody who was going to do an in-the-grip kind of presentation, I was, I've been completely able to get across that, you know, that isn't, that isn't something you just do this or do that. You know, it, it, it takes a real willingness to get that you need to feel the pain that you inflict. And that links up for me with something Jung said. He said, there is no greater pain than realizing the pain that you cause a loved one. That's just profound to me, you know, that, and you can see where an INFP would value that. And so I do allow myself to experience deep pain from time to time uh, for my own behavior. And uh, there's, there's, no, there's no way to undo that either. Um, you, you know, that's another thing is you, you, can't, you can't really undo it. Um, you can only, you know, you have to kind of let go so that you can let in the love that that person has for you. Yeah, it's true. There's no greater pain than knowing that you've hurt a loved one. And that can be a great transformative agent, a wake up call, a slap in the face to change one's behavior. One of the biggest motivations to almost reevaluate how you've been operating on autopilot and how the autopilot might have been accidentally hurting people. And so I really love that amount of self-awareness that you have, Nancy. And so she is a board member of the Sacramento Association of Psychological Type. And yeah, we're going to be going through John Beebe's eight function model today. And I have an infographic to help people follow along as it might be a very complex subject. But yeah, Nancy, I'd like to ask you about your experience with your hero function, your dominant function, introverted feeling. Okay, <clears throat> is it up? Is that slide up? It is now, yeah. So as you see here, the hero function, the need is competence and mastery. And the behavior is it welcomes challenges and reliability. Yeah, um, I think uh, in my own life um, that the hero function of introverted feeling doesn't have much play in those younger years and like I said when I was a child um, I roamed the neighborhood mostly with a boy down the street who was a couple years younger than me but we we played games you know we played games in the street we played um, we played canasta we played uh, and uh, so I think and, and uh, Isabel Brooks Myers says this too, that introverts develop an extroverted side much more, much earlier than, um, than an extrovert. But um, it's hard for me to find that introvert in my childhood because um, I just, I was one of those kids that gathered other kids in the neighborhood and, and um, 
or when exploring with the boy down the street. Um, and, you know, kind of anything goes. I loved riding bikes. And um, in school, t people did tend to befriend me. They would just go, Nancy. And eventually I realized that most of these people were extroverts and maybe part of what they liked about me as I got a little, you know, seventh grade, stuff like that. They loved that I listened. So an extrovert doesn't get enough of that because they're constantly interrupting each other. So I really see that most of what I saw and most of what others saw was me extroverting through that into it intuition didn't really matter you know what we were doing there was always another option and we we played pretend games roles cowboys and indians um, i'm a lot older than than most of the people who would listen to this <laughs> and um i loved my dog um and still have dogs um and riding bikes and playing with the other children. In school, um, I was so lucky, you know, the first three years to go to a public school that was nearby because the Catholic school was so crowded. And once I started at Catholic school, it was very, it was like all joy really left my life. Um, until fifth grade when I had a lay teacher. And she, I think she saw my intelligence. I, she, she really, really liked me. And um, uh, anyway, her name was Mrs. Fleming. And um, so I could, whenever I wanted to get A's, but I had to want to. And um, so there's that kind of, it's just, it's a decision that gets made by me. Uh, and when I'm not in control, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to change my, my decision. Um, I don't know if I'm quite staying by the, um, let me see that again, the thing. Okay. So definitely in a sense, uh, I very much fostered the development of other people, even the kids in the street, and, and served as a role model that was sometimes negative, as far as the parents were concerned, maybe negative. Um, and uh, th this one about the eternal child just really, really strikes me because um, Let's see, sometimes original and creative. Definitely another aspect uh, throughout Ooh. my childhood was that I was learning how to play the piano and I became really good at it. By the time I was 13, I had taught myself to play Rhapsody in Blue from start to finish and it was over 30 pages. And um, so, you know, that was known. That was known to me, so that was that was um, you know that confidence and mastery and and standing out from the crowd. I always had to be in in chosen areas better than than it, you know I as much as possible. Um, but uh, in, even in the piano, when I was twelve or thirteen, I broke my finger. And so I wasn't taking piano lessons for a while. And it was during that period that I took, taught myself Rhapsody in Blue. I had the record, too, so I played it really fast, like Oscar or Levon, Levon, I think his name was. And so when I went back to my teacher and I wanted to play that piece in the recital, she, she um, ended teaching me. She, you know, she didn't want me controlling her. And she, she felt that I had copied Oscar LeBron's style, which I had, and I didn't cry. <laughs> but anyway, I started with another teacher. 
But that child part of me, it was, it, it was as if the adult world was really something I could take or not. And I didn't have a father in our family. My mother was divorced when I was about two, so I only saw him a few times. And so, you know, I didn't have any strong, you know, you do this or else. Um, my mom probably was an INFP herself, and she was, you know, the, the one that we talked about. She really never showed emotion, um, except when she was in this kind of martyr state. Um, she never talked um, to my sister and I. And... Um, our dinners were silent, except for me and my sister throwing food across the table. We were trying to get attention. And my poor sister, I think, probably was ENFP. So she starved in this introvert, mom and sister, you know. Um, it was, I think that was really, really hard on her. Um Let's see that list again. So I was down kind of at the child. Um, what I see today and in the past many years is that my eternal child is probably um, introverted sensing. And what I see about myself there today and in the last few years is that I love Excel. Well, what is Excel but copy, you know, writing down reality? But you're always writing it down from the past. You know, you do your taxes, it's the past. You you download your, your bank statements, it's from the past. And that is um, – uh, and, and then never wanting to do the analysis – of those documents. So, you know, I'll create Excel document after Excel document, and then it comes time to do taxes, and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. But I have to do my own because I want I want to be able to play. I want, and that is, for me, taxes are a little bit of a game. Um, how, you, how you tell your story is how you you know, figure out how to, manip you know, manipulate the expenditures that you have. And um, so, um, so I like doing that, but it also really, really helped me in my work to be able to do um, Excel. And I was able to create an Excel document for managing a very complex management program that the Department of Transportation was doing for their management staff. But in the training office, of course, there were several people working together to put that event on once a month, you know, over a period of months. So each program was the start of a new program. And, the, and, and they were all kind of in, at different stages every month so that one program would have started, one program would have already been halfway down the road, etc. And I was able to use an Excel document to put together each person's role in whichever uh, part of that every month so that they were all interchangeable and they wouldn't get confused. And um, and then just with a click of a switch, you could put in, you know, another one and it would just, you know, drop down this complicated list and insert itself where it needed to be. So um, <clears throat> my sons do the same thing. They, um, they invent programs for the places that they work. And one of my sons is actually an IT manager. Um, and so that's kind of where the child uh, it is. But don't you see that child as being extroverted sensing as a child, you know, in the neighborhood, playing games in the street, you know, running around with the other kids? I see that as extroverted sensing. I loved 
being outside, still do. Loved camping, loved, you know, as an adult, hiking and stuff like that. Love being in nature of any kind. It can just be in my backyard. Um, but I do see that extroverted sensing for me is a toy. And I don't know if you can quite understand that. My daughter is extroverted sensing preference. And um, she, it took me years and years and years and years to see that for her, that wasn't, yeah, it was my trickster. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, it's in my tr trickster. Um, but as you know, in the eight function model, but um, her extroverted sensing isn't sensuality particularly. It is informational. It has, you know, it, there's no value exactly put to that. Uh, yes, she can take in all these things that are going on around her um, instantly, you know, without without I would have to be thinking like crazy to do that um, and it would slow down the process tremendously she's she's like a camera she doesn't judge what she's seeing her thinking function does that so if she has to get out of the way of an accident on a freeway that thinking function get you know says dodge over it. the sensing function tells her where to go and it was it's a really interesting process for me because i'm so value laden that everything has a value so to be outside she is one, one you know i used to like to take the kids everywhere i went but um she's the one who said once you've seen a redwood you've seen them all doesn't that exactly express the, the you know, the, there's no priority in that sensing. And um, I could use a little bit of a feedback there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fascinating indeed. I love how one of the functions will remind you of another function and then you'll just go to that function and then you'll go to the other function. It's like, I don't have to ask much. You're already inferring into what, where to go and you're filling it in. So it's amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of introverted sensing in your answers because you're providing a lot about the past and past context as you're answering too, which is fascinating. But yeah, are there any other functional traits that you'd like to highlight in John Beebe's attitudes before we move on to the questions? Um. <clears throat> So, I would like to talk about um, the opposing personality. Sure. <laughs> and, um, oh my gosh, you know, it's just been such a challenge for me uh, figuring out what role that really does play in my life. And, of course, it feels so... Um, what you, what's a, I, the word isn't coming to me, but oppositional. <laughs> and um, uh, and so I've been, for instance, in, in relationships at work and in relationships, personal relationships where that just uh, that feeling of the, the opposition where um, just every single thing that, you know, would get brought up would somehow turn into something oppositional. And at one of John's seminars, I finally clicked that um, uh, that it's a form of developing, and it's a primitive form of developing, most primitive who am I not? And so if someone is opposing me, then I can now say to myself, 
they're figuring out who they are by, you know, by challenging me. And, and if I don't respond to it, they kind of move on <laughs> because uh, that, that's, that, that's where they really are. They really need that. And, and I can see in some of the rebelliousness that I felt in the work situation or um, as a child, I did it internally against the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, a lot of my personality was revealed through those opposing, those opposing things. How I felt about God, how I felt about being a woman um, or being a girl. Um, and um, and so John actually um, verified that for me in the presentations that he did. Um, it just has really allowed me to kind of move on, you know, not to feel so out of control, even if I do react. Um, I can have a conversation with me later. Um, <laughs> So that and that has been so interesting to realize that another big realization which um, I came to about that was actually Elizabeth Briggs Myers um, herself. She only did the first, you know the first four functions. I mean that was her model was all the, those first four. So introverted and extroverted were lumped together for feeling, thinking, um, and for sensing uh, intuition. They all were just lumped together. And it made it difficult for lots of people to identify with the definitions. So, you know, it's not that she didn't write those definitions uh, in some of her books but the 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 four functions you know when you taught the MBTI to people were just those four functions and um, it was a huge huge relief to hear you know the difference between say introverted feeling and extroverted feeling but the thing is that they are opposing personalities and so it kind of explained to me why I had that authority pushback with extroverted feeling types and there you know there are quite a few of those in in the type community and that's when you actually know someone is extroverted feeling so you can kind of study it and it allowed me knowing those differences to really start to look at extroverted feeling and to sort of end this oppositional, I mean, to deliberately set that aside to see if I could find the value in extroverted feeling. And you can maybe see in the words convention, conventional, extroverted feeling and extroverted thinking are both conventional thinking. They're not outside the box in themselves. An extroverted feeling mother will guide her child very firmly through what is done in how to behave in the world and what's right and wrong and stuff like that. I feel fortunate that I didn't have that because I'm not a person that's easily bossed around. <laughs> In fact, this little thing thinks she can boss me around. <laughs> she doesn't get anywhere. So uh, she gets put in the other room. But <laughs> so. What name does that puppy have? She, her name is Curly. I, was, I didn't name these dogs. Her name is Curly. And her mother's name is Lost. And they're all extroverted sensing names because... Uh, curly is curly and lost is still lost. She's a stray <laughs> who had curly as her baby. 
<laughs> that is absolutely awesome. And so we will go on to the Q and A component. Okay. And we will answer everyone's lovely questions. And so Katie asks, have you felt behind in life? Where did you think this feeling comes from? Self expectations or others expectations? Um, I'll, I'll answer it both ways because uh, yes, there are very distinct um, places in my life where um, where I have felt behind. Um, and like I said, in the third grade, when I went into a Catholic school and I got all this um, propaganda, really, um, and I reacted to that by going inward and I probably was using my <laughs> extroverted thinking <clears throat> to, you know, dis disqualified them, those teachers, from my um, list of competent, of somebody competent enough to teach me stuff. Um, and that was a, I was even able to move back and forth over that. Like my third grade teacher was incredibly competent in math. And, you know, I allowed her to come in and, uh, you know, just, I loved how she did that. Um, but she also frightened all of us with her stories of martyrdom and communism and stuff like that. And, um, the fourth grade teacher was just stupid. <laughs> it was really, 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 really easy to write her off. But, you know, that I didn't exactly, I guess you'd say I felt behind. But um, the next place where I felt so confident was in the first 15 years of my career when I was just allowed to do all these really, really neat things and travel and and create training programs and write them and have a team that, you know, we just worked together like uh, we were great. And, you know, the MBTI really, really helped with that. They knew their type and or type preferences. And um, so we were, we, we had this easy, you know, we would even use it inside the team to, okay, did, did you, did you notice that? The J's brought in materials that were already written and the P's wrote them themselves. <laughs> um, that was, it, and it made it fun and interesting. Um, we didn't have the eight function model, but it still was very, very, very useful. But the last 15 years was really a pushback. The first 15 years, I was always my own manager in a way. I was the head of the training office. Uh, the last 15 years, I wanted to come back downtown where I live, and I sacrificed being the manager and became a co-training officer. It was the same classification, but not a departmental. And it, it really got more and more and more painful. Um, and uh, so, yes, uh, you can say, and today... I, I have my own self-expectations that are, you know, exhorting me to catch up. I've um, allowed myself to get focused on other people's um, challenges and neglected my own. And now I'm having to, um, I have huge self-expectations and the inability to, you know, carry them out in the present. Uh, and I'm struggling with that, but it, it's a challenge I love, so. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful answer indeed. And so before we move on to the next uh, questions up ahead, I wanted to let everyone know about the winter conference that's coming up at the Association of Psychological Type International. And so if you wanna see John Beebe, Dario Nardi and other amazing speakers at this event, feel free to check it out in the links below once I put it there. <laughs> uh, 
And so you'll see that I'm interviewing a lot of people from the Association of Psychological Type and from the different communities that aren't typically on YouTube. And that's because I kind of want to help build a bridge between the different chapters between type and have everyone meet each other and get along. So that was a part of the goal, the master mind goal. <laughs> and so Nancy, the next question we have is from Andrew and he asks, what are some lessons you've learned when you led your team in the corrective department? One big one, which I shared earlier is that in, and, and this came out maybe more, you know, as I went on to other departments, but um, I got so much respect in the Department of Corrections because of my role on a team. And so uh, that it doesn't matter what your classification is in corrections. If you have the lead role, you are the leader and they, they will, you know, they, have that respect for nominal authority that you know other uh, other departments don't have, um, and I what I I had the freedom to choose my subject matter. So for all the new employee orientations that were that I gave a team at uh, corrections. I was able to administer the MBTI. So, and we had a week together, so they knew their type preferences. And those type preferences were validated. <laughs> They'd take their results home and, you know, around the dinner table, they would share them and the family would, oh yeah, dad, oh, oh that's you, you know. So they, it, it became an integral part of the way we, continue to communicate later because they would be on a team and they would, you know, together with, you know, for some other reason. Um, and so I would say that there's huge advantages to people knowing their type preferences because there's so many lessons that come with that. And the, the biggest one, I think, is that all types contribute value. And at first, this is another lesson I think that I learned throughout those many years, first 15, are that you go through a honeymoon period where you just think, oh my God, INFPs are the best and only best. <laughs> and, you know, it takes discipline to, to realize this is the mom. This is the, um, it takes years to, uh, and, and I think definitely being part of a team in that environment, you have to create respect for other type preferences. Um, you, you just, you have to help people see that without those P's, new, new lesson plans weren't going to get written, or without those J's, you wouldn't be able to meet your, your, your goal in time. And, um, and to kind of joke a little bit, you know, about, about the frictions. Uh, it gave us a sense of humor about that and, and, a, and a, a sense of acceptance. Mm. Yes, well put, well put. And so what is your experience with doubt? How do you deal with it? Oh, <laughs> um, I think that's a really uh, temporal, you know, that takes up a huge portion of my, my life, really. And Especially, you know, when you're deeply involved with someone who's in an opposing personality or an environment that's in an, an, an opposing personality. So I share with you, you know, corrections was not a opposing personality for me. Um, and so I had a lot of um, 
I had a lot of confidence and joy. Uh, I, I loved my experiences during there. Um, and after that, um, you know, with the um, environment being more uh, controlling and unreasonable, <laughs> um, there, there could be, say, a lot of anger uh, that was withheld because of the situation. And then you form cliques with somebody that, you know, agree about that. Um, this also was during the era of 9-11, uh, and um, I was working at PERS, CalPERS, at the, on the day of 9-11, and we were forced to stay in that building by my, by my supervisor long after other departments had been freed to go home. We didn't know if we were going to be alive another day, and it greatly affected my health. Um, so there, you know, but I, I would say that what I see in myself is either I become oppositional and I keep it out here, you know, anger is a, a real adrenaline rush and it does in a sense protect you from fear. It gives you a sense that you have power and, ex and that you truly exist. But um, when you're not in the situation itself that's causing that doubt, like you um, are part of a team and you, you, you just feel like you're not really being included. For me, it caused a lot of paranoia. And, um, and uh, throughout those second 15 years, you know, I often dealt with uh, with paranoia and an internal fighting back and uh, keeping, you know, trying to keep track, trying to nail down what was really happening. Um, very recently, because I've realized the role of the opposing personality, um, I can free myself from what's, you know, what I, even if I have doubt, it's just, it's just a, you know, it's more of a, um, like that sensing thing. It's a fact. <laughs> I had that thought, and uh, there are lots of other things I can think about, or just let, you know, let that moment move on, which is a lot. Uh, it's it's really a wonderful uh, release. That sensing, you know, being able to look out a window or just to to visit my internal state can be very centering. Mm. Yeah. Well, what ideas and concepts do you flirt with the most? I do love playing with John Beebe's model and, you know, with myself, like, which, where am I now? You know, oh, that's, Maybe that fits here. Maybe that fits there. Um, uh, I would say the last several years, though, I really have been dealing with that um, opposing personality stuff, and and um, and then you know this relinquishing of power, which I don't have. You know, letting go of stuff I, you know, I may never know. I may never know if that, that thought it has any reality or not. And um, uh, allowing um, the, well, concepts. Definitely, you know, typology is, is huge for me. Oh no, internet connectivity issues. <laughs> See? This is my worst fear as I go live. <laughs> the uh, freezing of computer networks. But as we are dealing with these tech issues, I guess perhaps I can talk with you all. Hey, you're all, you're all stuck with me. 
And so feel free to ask Joyce questions and Joyce will answer as much as Joyce can. <laughs> oh, hey, Nancy. <laughs> 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 uh, while you were frozen i asked the chat what do you want me to do and then they're like can you impersonate an eye oh! and i was like i'm gonna die why <laughs> <laughs> the next question is do you think infps are prone to depression if so why do you think that is um I I can see, you know, from something that I said earlier, uh, where it, it might be interpreted as depression because there's that inner processing. And we're not even particularly extrovertedly aware of, you know, how we might do that. Um, I do think that, you know, life during a strong opposing personality is in a way a form of depression, but it's where the anger masks the depression. Depression meaning lack of affect, lack of differentiation of emotion. So um, depression to me is the complete absence of differentiation of almost any kind. That's why we call it gray. <laughs> um, and so um, uh, I can see where there's been a lot of anger in uh, some of my relationships and that I would now see as, you know, where my life was not in my control. And of course, I'm learning and teaching myself that I always was in control. I just chose anger rather than, you know, taking responsibility for that. Mm, yeah. I, I sometimes, oh, continue, my bad. No, 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 I really want to hear it. Yeah. I never know when NE has the stopping point because I'm like, when is like when is any going to stop or do they have another idea that they're going to branch off to? And I, I don't know when to judge that. Oh, okay. They're firmly stopped here. All right. All right. I'm going to jump in. <laughs> and so INFPs and depression, I find I, a lot of INFPs and INFJs are a little bit more prone to depression because some of them, like a subtype of them deal with existentialism a lot. Like if you look at Soren Kierkegaard, he was an angsty boy and he's a philosopher. And sometimes when you have a lot of thoughts about existence or just about life itself or just these broader concepts, it can make you spiral down to dark places. Uh, so I noticed neuroticism tends to group with those, some, some sections of those types. So it would make sense. Uh, ST, did you say Kierkegaard mm -hmm. was? Did you say Kierkegaard was? I think, I think uh, Kierkegaard is an INFP, in my opinion. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It, Definitely those big questions. And depending on the answers, um, that to me would, you know, do they lead you to uh, a philosophy that... Um, where you have no control mm. and um that's very interesting that you see it as infp i um, had a pretty long relationship with somebody i i don't really i i've guessed and guessed what type he is but um where he chose um there's so many philosophies out there today, you know, on the internet and stuff. And so he chose things where, you know, you have absolutely no control. Well, I would say that's pretty depressing where um, typology is not no control. 
in fact, the more you know, the more I think, the more control you and control joy, you know, you can let in your life. And so anyway, but I my mother I think was INFP and she was I think clinically depressed through my childhood. And but I think it was induced by some surgery that she was given that she didn't need and that afterwards she got absolutely no support or knowledge or anything about, you know, uh, building her back up emotionally. So, yeah. So the moral of the story is that depression can come from a myriad of causes and sometimes it is rooted in situations where there are situations that gone wrong and you, you you don't always have a solution or closure to those situations and the lack of closure to traumatic situations can cause depression because there's an element of feeling hopeless or out of control or a despair to it um in some sense and so do you think type can be used to reach a wider demographic without being becoming yet another tool for discrimination, asked Matthew. And so, yes, I do believe that is the case. I see type as a needle for injection. So you can either use a needle in a health context to provide a life-saving drug to someone, or you can use that same needle for euthanasia. So ultimately what you use type for is up to the user um, and it's not type's fault <laughs> what you use it for. Um, I think that there's an, a human disposition to want to use type to create otherness, which is why Color Young talks about the concept of one-sidedness. Uh, he talks about when you double down on the natural parts of your personality to a too much of an extent you create a one-sidedness and everything that is not similar to you you create an otherness to them and so people's inclination to use type in a discriminatory way comes from their one-sidedness their desire to use everything around them to create otherness so it's not types fault. It shows the collective mentality of otherness that comes from a society that is a majority wise one-sided. And I think type in its best use is to tell you, hey, you are projecting onto other people how you would want them to be based off of how you process the world. And so instead of projecting on everyone should be like me, like what Linda Barron's says, you know, be like me syndrome. Instead, you notice that other people actually think differently than you and that when they're not using this part of their brain, they're actually allocating that energy towards other areas of their brain instead. Because the natural inclination for people when someone can't do something that you can do is to sometimes say, oh, you're just not using your brain in general. When the reality is typically they're just allocating different parts of energy towards different parts of their brain, which is why they may not be as good at, at certain things as you are. And so, yes, I believe that type can be used in a good way when used responsibly. <laughs> but how about you, Nancy? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, you know, <clears throat> um, and I, I had a recent, fairly recent experience um, <clears throat> with, uh, with someone who, insisted that um, I was unsuitable for a certain ro role because of my type and that this person was suitable for this because of his or her type. And it was, it was very, uh, it was devastating to my ego, I should say. Um, but it was a sharp reminder that and over time, you know, that relationship has worked out really, really well. So um, I, I think it's, if you're going to, you know, uh, reach uh, 
prevent it becoming a tool for discrimination is that you take, you know, that person and, you know, that group through, you are going to, you know, the first year to 10 years, maybe, you're going to so worship who you are that you are going to really think that your type is the type and that everyone else is just an S or just a T or just a J or just an E or, you know, you're just going to do that. And, you know, when you do that, watch yourself doing it because eventually you're going to grow up and you're going to realize that every type is valued in this world. We did not evolve as a, a human population to be one type, one superior type. Um, we evolved in, in response to nature and what we were going through. And at different times, different types have you know, added or detracted from the current civilization. But you know, enjoy your honeymoon period and realize that you know, you're really doing what, the, what type you're not taking advantage of what type gives you, which is your own blindness to other types. Because I think that's useful. That kind of puts them on notice. And to begin to train yourself to watch for those blind spots. And the example that I would give is that I had a performance report from my supervisor in the Department of Corrections. And in it, she said something about me being late. And I was very offended because I had already made a, uh, a you know, a, an agreement with her that if I came three minutes late, I would stay three minutes late. Well, it took me a very long time. I was, it, this caused me a lot of consternation to realize that that was the quite way the question was worded. She was an S, so she answered the question correctly. It didn't say, does Nancy make up her time? Or, you know, she was just doing her S. And it just, it just was so wonderful to me to be able to see that lens, but I could only see it with a, you know, big smashing <laughs> of my own um, preference. And over and over again now, I welcome the window that you, Joyce, gave so many of us the other day where you would describe the behavior uh, or the thought process and then you would kind of tell what that what what part of the you're calling it part of the brain you didn't call it that the other day but where that person was trying to you know get to or what uh, road they were on and it it just it just pulls down all the the angst that you felt about it their their motivation has so little to do with what you conjured up in your mind from your type preference. Yeah, one of the greatest amazing benefits of knowing type is not taking other people's actions personally. And so judgment is the greatest form of projection. So type actually helps us judge less and project less and it gives us greater peace through that. And yeah, whenever you use type in a hiring or promotion decision-making type of process. It is both unethical and illegal too. And so you learn during MBTI certification that you should never use it for those purposes. So the people who are doing that are just these random rogue people who <laughs> are using it for that way, but not all of us are like that. It, we're all told that that's against the code of ethics 100%. And so Errol asks, 
Thanks for sharing your experiences. Can you share some techniques you have used to better interact, connect with high FE users? Yes. Um, there are several FE users in the type community that I've been a part of for several years. And so once I kind of understood that opposing personality stuff, um, I began to pick out people who had FE as, um, because I wanted to understand my animosity. There was just this kind of friction, you know. Uh, and again, you know, that friction comes from collective, what I would call collective intelligence. And so I began to actually shift some of my, my some of my feeling function shifted to an awareness of them as individuals. Um, I just began to maybe gent gently let go or they, they kind of went as I got to know them better. Um, and from time to time, that shift back again, you know, to um, this person wants control and they're shutting out, um, they're shutting out, uh, they're shutting out, you know, other people, other people who might um, uh, want some control you know, that they think belongs to them. <laughs> but that, you know, that that's because it's been over periods of years and their roles are changing too. Um, so when they're, I would suggest that when they're in a new role, they become more conscious of needing to exert power over information. And remember that another aspect of many extroverted feeling types, uh, extroverted feeling types, is they have introverted intuition. And it really wasn't until the last year that I understood the friction between an extroverted intuitor and an introverted intuitor. And so little is really said about that. And, and Joyce, you've probably done a really good job of it. Um, this, you know, this, the extroverted intuition is often at play with extroverted feeling. Uh, and so they're very threatened, I'm going to suggest, by more by my extroverted intuition, willingness to, okay, they're, okay, things have changed. All right, well, that, then here's the options that pop up. What do you mean, you know, we've got to think about this again, you know. Um, it's so, it, in their mind, you are fickle. For me to be able to see how I'm viewed in a situation where you're trying to survive um, <clears throat> as fickle. You're just fickle. You're unreliable. You talk too much. Uh, I can't think. Um you trigger me, etc. cetera. Um, I sat up one night reading, once I caught that, Linda Barron's um, interpretation of introverted intuition. And I just immediately got it. And uh, I've just been able to stay out of that, that um, what would you call it, mine? Uh, and, um, and we we have a really 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 nice relationship now. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. What does your support network look like? How important is it for people to maintain relationships with others? Yeah, um, I think it's very 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 important. It's maybe especially for an INFP. I think that um, people with an extroverted um, tendency are 
they're just in the midst of uh, others, you know, just because of their nature. Um, I tend to want deep relationships. And so um, in the last uh, several years, I was, I allowed myself to become really bogged down in just tasks, problem solving, and uh, it really shut out the time that I spent with others. And uh, once that, you know, started to go away, all these long-term relationships that I've had with other women just came bounding back in, just like my little curly hair. Uh, joyful, laughing, um, all kinds of little fun things to do that had no um, out, output or or actually doing sensing things like gardening or cooking or something like that. And it just shows me my, my relationships are long-term and they don't die even if they're not nurtured for long periods of time. Mm, well put. Any advice for INFPs in their early adulthood stage? I think it would help to to be exposed to type and to have their parents exposed to type uh, tremendously. But one, one of the key things I realized, since I had access to the MBTI very early, I would take it every few days. <laughs> Not really, but close to that. I think a lot of people did. And what I noticed is that my FI and TE were just like one or two apart. And that under pressure, my NT, my extroverted thing, the intuition would go way over, like, like way over. And sensing would be just obliterated, obviously, the real world. <laughs> and, um, and eventually, I thought, well, what? what circumstances are you in that would help you develop FI? You know, that, and I was working in an organization thinking is, you know, the way everybody wants to appear. Extroverted, they want to appear that way. They um, probably um, often, in fact, I've seen proof of that, modify their answers according to the um, situation they're in. So, um, so FI children, um, like I said, I don't see evidence. I, I guess I did internally. I made decisions very young that I was going to have children. And I didn't even think about marriage. And um, that um, I was going to <clears throat> very early in life allow them to acknowledge their sexuality because I felt I lived in a very repressed and I did environment as a child. So I made decisions about my future at a pretty early age, but you know, how many of those, most of the time I was in what I think of as extroverted sensing. Interesting. Have you done jobs to which you feel you are particularly suited or unsuited? <laughs> Both. But I, I think my job, you know, uh, in staff development was wonderful for me. I fell into it by accident. <clears throat> I majored in psychology. Um, that was always of interest to me. And, um, and, uh, working for the state allowed me that intuition, extroverted intuition, to move from one department to another, um, which gave me a different external reality and, you know, different values. Um, and so I think the state was a very good employer for me. It allowed me to make a bargain that I could see. I worked this much, I get this much time off. Um, it's very transparent, or at least it was. And so that external was taken care of and I could concentrate on the quality that I brought to the job. And it allowed for tremendous creativity. 
um, I would be given a topic and, you know, do an analytical process to bring it, you know, through, through the okay period. I loved, you know, writing. I liked the uh, analytical stuff. And, you know, something that just came up recently, um, I don't have a good memory for names. I don't have a good memory for, um, you know, uh, facts. And so if somebody asks me a question in the middle of something, unless it's a topic like this, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to sh shut up and, and stutter. Um, but what the state allowed me to do was to do research. So I all early on had um, access to a word processor and did my own typing and writing and then, um, you know, it gave me a lot of training and analytical skills and composition and stuff. And um, so it, you know, I did a lot of writing, I did a lot of presentations, I did a lot of group things where you bring out people's knowledge and stuff. I, I did career development stuff. I think I was very well suited for that position. I'm not suited for um, bosses who are not knowledgeable about what they're, about the topic that they're a manager of, which um, often, often happens. And so I, the, I interpret it that, you know, you are a threat to them. How, somehow their authority is threatened by your knowledge, but they believe that they don't have to have that knowledge. So uh, they're not counting on it in you. It's, it's a double bind. And, you know, that was a very important thing for me to learn. And John Beebe brings brought that out, I think, in his work with uh, one of the movies that he presented. And a double bind is where you can't go in either direction. Both, both are failure. You know, if you go to either one, they're a they're failure. And if you don't go to either one of them, you're you're it's it's where you're doomed to failure. And he attributes that to I can't remember McGregor, right? Is it McGregor who does the double bind? Look it up yourself and, and um, wiki and it's uh, the example that's given is the child who is approached by a molester and says if you if you if you tell your parents if, if you go to your parents I'll tell them that you asked for it so the child is forced to go on you know collaborating with this person and not telling his parents and if he does tell his parents his parents might very well do exactly what he, he, he told them they would do, which is believe him and not, not this kid. It's, and it happens all the time, you know, it happens all the time. I mean, understand that uh, concept. Um, and that is what he, John also puts as being the trickster's trick. It, which I thought was interesting because I, I don't yet see where I did that as a child. I just played, you know. <laughs> mm. Do you have a daily routine? How would you recommend an INFP to develop one? I would recommend for an INFP to every day how to develop a routine and every day do a new one. Um, this daily routines that I try are the, the introverted sensing backwards. <laughs> so it hasn't been created yet, but you're gonna try and put it into an Excel document or something like that. And so, you know, the routine has to come from intuition, actually. And intuition is free-flowing and responding to the moment. 
And when an INFP tries to rigidify what they do every day, they promise a day without feeling. There's no way it is through the free flowing introverted, into, uh, extroverted intuition that the INFP connects with the world. And so any routine is really out of the world. Um, it, it's in your mind, but that's not in your FI mind either. And so um, it leads to deadness and depression. You'll never win. So just enjoy the way you are every day. Create a new one. <laughs> Let yourself respond to those things that come up. They create the joy and the real meaning for you in your life. That being said, there are some INFPs who do really, really well with routine too because of the tertiary SI. So bear that in mind too. Um, and so how do you relate to other IP types, especially INTPs and ISTPs? Uh, I love INTPs. Um, and uh, my sons, all they're, they're probably ENTPs, but they have that introverted thinking. Um, and I think that introverted thinking and introverted feeling are original, that they're using their introverted thinking as, um, it is logical, but it is original. It is focused on uh, that the extroverted thinking is using models, templates, um, which is what I was able to use in my work with the state. You know, they were, everything was a template. The analytical process, the way you, you presented a, um, a new, new idea, the research that you did for it, stuff like that. Um, so you did it on things that had worked in the past, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and that's how you made made your point and made it safe for them to try something new. Um, but the introverted thinking will constantly surprise you with the, uh, will surprise me, I should say, with what they put together logically. And it's very convincing and interesting to me. The introverted intuition in an ion, let's see, is it? No, they extrovert through uh, 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 intuition, and so we have a we have a way to speak to each other. Um, ISTPs, I don't know very many. Um, I think I know of ISTPs. They're very you know, supposedly. Um, Uh, very physical uh, and independent and oblivious of social norms and uh, confident and constantly in trouble. <laughs> Do you want other people to provide structure for you to operate within or does this feel oppressive to you? I'm learning to accept uh, structure more than maybe I, more consciously than I was in the past. And to realize that I do react to structure. I do react to structure. Uh, if, I don't know if that makes sense to you, is that I have an internal response to structure that I'm now going, well, that, that is my reaction. Um, is there something here of value for me to allow other people to provide structure? Certainly in one of, one of my relationships with one of my children, he's provided ex what I would call extreme 
structure in the past and uh, until very recently we, we couldn't get along. I think I had to reach a stage where I had more freedom in my own personal life before I could maintain me and without the anger, without the feelings oppressive, you know, it's a decision that I make to do it or not. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a creative outlet? Um, <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. No, yes. <laughs> but, uh, definitely type especially the last couple years because it was kind of threatened there by the uh, coronavirus um, and it's just zoom and these uh, this ability to get together with um, people around the world um, has just been a wonderful outlet for me and to be able to uh, make that come alive and make those connections and um, expand our little type community here in Sacramento um, to, you know, all these other connections. And, um, but I also love playing the piano and I love the house I live in and um, the challenge of um, keep trying to keep up with it, um, trying to recover from uh, not doing my taxes for um, uh, several years. That is creative for me, by the way. Um, uh, and uh, to learn the technologies, you know, that go with Zoom. Um, and now with you, Joyce, you know, to see this um, reciprocative thing that you bring to Sacramento APT. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And so for context, I gave a presentation at the Sacramento Association of Psychological Type a few days ago. And so that's where I met Nancy. And it's been a blessing to my life ever since. <laughs> we were, yeah, each other's mutual outlet of our love of type. <laughs> I find... Can I, can I say something about your presentation? I was the Zoom uh, technical person on that. And one of the things I watch for is like watch faces. That's something that Zoom gives you. And um, throughout the presentation, I was watching some of the other INFPs and their faces were dark and down and, you know, that. so they were in that role of, you know, processing and then as, as it went toward the end and she stayed for these this more um, spontaneous part, they just lit up, they're just, their faces lit up, they had more light, they, you know, they stayed, everybody stayed at the very end, even though the last part was optional. We just, you are a f fresh air and lots of laughing, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if there were heart emojis I could send right now, I'd send a billion. So. <laughs> and so how has learning about MBTI and its functions helped you as an INFP? I don't think I would be a person that I am or, or have been, you know, that individuation process. Uh, Jung didn't expect it to even get to the tertiary. And um, John Beebe wrote an article about how he developed the uh, eight function model. And um, certainly, you know, their presentations going, you know, and differentiating these functions, the biggest leap was when they put them with the archetypes. The archetypes really helped me us figure out or at least put a name to the process I'm in. So for instance, opposing personality. You're you can be in an opposing personality and it doesn't matter what type what typology or 
the function attitude is in there, it stays stable. It's just below consciousness. <laughs> and, you know, to appreciate um, without the eight function model, I don't think you could ever really reach those shadow functions and understand their role in your life. For instance, the uh, next function is about the Senex and the um, uh, the wise person, the old person, the witch, the uh, critical parent. Um, for me, the realization that those were below consciousness, they're about boundaries. That's what, um, that's what uh, Adam Fry brought to that level. And so now you, I understand why there's so much friction about boundaries. They're, they're invisible to you until they're stepped on. It's like being the edge of a continent, you know, and as someone gets closer to your edge and they begin to put their feet on your ledge beneath the surface, you're triggered. And then you wonder, and you write Ann Landers about it. <laughs> That's really old fashioned, but um, you write, you know, about how somebody's stepping on your boundaries and, you know, you complain about it rather than realizing that this this function is there for you to act, but it's in a primitive state and you've got to consciously develop that or you're going to be, you know, trigger all the time and you're going to be hating people and unnecessarily you just need to, you know, find ways of stating your boundaries and, you know, making it safe for you to, to have that boundary. Yeah. The, the, this touches on FI users and how they're chill and relax until they aren't. So until a, a value is crossed. <laughs> oh my God. Then I scare people sometimes. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> then the bear or the volcano comes <laughs> up. <laughs> Were you previously mistyped? If so, you can share your process of elimination. In uh, my role as a staff development person, people always said to me, you're not an introvert, you're an extrovert. And yeah, when I'm in an extroverted role, uh, they're, they're not... They just aren't seeing that. Um, but that's about, you know, that's the only one that comes to mind. Mm, yeah, yeah. Introverts can activate a very extroverted mask for short periods of time. And so they can give off the illusion of appearing very animated and very outgoing and broadcasty for that short period of time. What can help with typing is figure out how a person's like throughout their entire life, not just in a moment, a singular moment of time. Because there have been countless times in which I've been called extroverted and it's just mind boggling. And so Janine asks, is your presentation online, Joyce? So it is available for the people who have signed up for it. I believe that they get sent the recording after, but I'm, I don't, I'm pretty sure that's not available online. Or what are your thoughts, Nancy? You you know how the logistics are for SAC EBT. <laughs> oh. oh, you mean the presentation that you did um, with us? Yeah. Um, uh, it's not online, no. It does only go to people who registered for the class. Yeah, but possibly in a few years time, I might be doing another presentation there too. So you can attend that one and you can get yes. the version of that. Yes. Yeah. We would love to have you every year. <laughs> you're just so much fun and you're just, you are very, very knowledgeable choice. Thank you. Oh, you're just hitting all of my heartstrings. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're all, we're all feeling it right now. And so what is your opinion on crying? What I notice about myself, um, I was in a relationship with somebody who was manipulated by a former partner by her crying. And it was interesting to me because 
I don't ever cry in a relationship with somebody to get them to do something. I cry at movies <laughs> or, you know, uh, when I'm thinking about ways that I hurt one of my children or um, I hear a story, you know, in a newspaper or something like that. So that's, I'm, that's just personal. Um, I very rarely would cry to get someone's someone to change what they're doing. Mm. Have you ever done psychedelic or some other mind altering discipline like meditative retreats? Yes. And uh, I, years and years and years ago, um, I took some psychedelics and I very much attribute my spiritual connection uh, to those experiences. They were always outdoors, which I find very different from the way things were experienced in the East, which is, you know, it's winter <laughs> 10 months of the year and slow skiing the other two. Um, <clears throat> and so they're not meant for going inward. They're made their best when they're taken where you can connect with your outer environment. So a concert or something. Um, maybe a party, but parties are a, a little bit unpredictable. But definitely nature. And mm -hmm. with people that you feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I hate meditation. It is just so non-sensual. <laughs> I never can, you know, even hope to get out of all the stuff that's going through my mind. You know what's meditative for me is playing the piano. Because as I'm playing, my mind does the, you know, in and out, across, no, no, no grabbing, no grabbing any particular thought. It just moves past me like a, you know, cloud. <laughs> yeah oh my gosh <laughs> it's so <laughs> fi to make a slight remark as in i hate blank state <laughs> like, that's the fi opinion seeping in. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> my infp brother thinks i am cold infps do not view silliness as an emotion is it my fi blind spot maybe so if you're saying FI blind spot, I'm assuming that this person's either an ENTP or an ESTP. So yeah, what is your opinion on ENTPs? Yeah. Well, that's interesting because, you know, one of the one of the people I'm very close to is an ENTP and uh, so I'm confused of my, my I'm oh. an NLP, so you think this is an ENTP, is that it? Yeah, yeah, so they said FI blind spot, and that's typically ENTP, and, or ESTP, and so what is your opinion of those types, uh, yeah, in general, we, we don't have to like answer, answer the questions. They're good for prompts for thought too. So any anything it generates within your brain cloud, feel free to like just vomit it to us. So yeah. I'm gonna do it from my, you know, my experience with my ENTP son. Okay. And I realized through um, that relationship that I can be way too serious um, because I I see his silliness. It's just it's just an adorable part of him, um, and he craves it. He needs it. He has to have that. So I encourage you to keep that and and um, maybe let your brother know that know how you're experiencing him, but not in a way that's aggressive. You know, just because 
that will appeal to his compassion, his FI, his, um, um, and you both have extroverted intuition as in common. <clears throat> so um, another question you might ask him is, uh, does he see some of any of your ideas as being original or surprising to him? Um, because that introverted thinking is very, it's very original. And FIs love originality. <laughs> mm. Has anyone ever given you advice which meant a lot to you? Yeah. What is that piece of advice? Well, they come from my daughter, you know, this ESTP daughter. Um, and I do have an INFP friend who gives me advice uh, sometimes about, you know, how I've been, how I might have, how I may have interacted with some other people because she's often, you know, there and she's part of it. Um, I often invite advice from other people, uh, but I want to kind of stay away from doing that now that I'm older <laughs> because it creates a you know a, a world that you try to hang on to so if I went to somebody for advice it would be because I'm perceiving something a certain way and so I'm ultimately looking for support and creating a place where that 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 viewpoint is shared I'm not saying I would never do that, but I'm careful now because that will make me think that I need to hang on to that. Um, but my daughter's is always just, you know, it's that SE. There's, there's no controverting it. It's, it's factual observation of something I'm doing. And she, and her emotions will show she can cry in front of me and there's nothing manipulative about it mm -hmm. yeah so their advice meant a lot because it was a direct observation and so you can't really deny a straightforward look into what you've been doing interesting hmm what are some current pieces of advice that really have helped you? Like some sort of things that have stuck with you, quotes or specific ways of viewing something that altered your reality? Or what, what piece of advice would you give to someone who is discovering that they're an INFP or who has known that they're an INFP for a while? <laughs> um, you know, I, I even tend to jot down things that when people have said something or come across it, something on a um, screen. So one of the people that uh, has put a saying at the bottom of her emails, she's in my dream group and she's living in um, uh, oh, uh, it's on the other side of the world and um, she just, she's written a book on aging she's a Jungian background person type John Beebe all that and she wrote in this thing that she was quoting from that um, uh, when, you, when you see someone you hate um, stamp stamp out every bit of that hate inside yourself because that's coming from you. It's said much more powerfully than that. Um, but it is my motto. It is my motto to see that projection um, as, and I noticed what, from what you said, Joyce, that you're very, very aware of that. In fact, I think, um, is it? 
She's doing uh, the presentation on her book projection, which just came out of a year ago. Did you see that? I think Bapt is having that, is holding that. Yeah, from Carol Shoemake. Yes. Yeah, so I'll be interviewing Carol Shoemake on the 4th of February, and she specializes in John Beebe's eight function model and how it shows projection. You know, that, that type, one of the best uses for type is understanding projection and the way that we do it to other people. Yeah. And it hasn't been stressed that much. So I'm I'm very happy that um, she wrote this book on it. And she also has a website, I'm sure you know about Joyce, but um, her website has these ongoing articles that are, she actually cites uh, her um, discoveries you know like where what book she got it out of and and if you follow them up it's there you know it's like really uh, really neat yeah mm -hmm. it i i really like the component of feeling cornered that you mentioned about your estp daughter and how her observations of you they're so there's no way to escape it because it's it's literally you can't <laughs> deny it anyway. And sometimes I find personal growth requires a little bit of being cornered because you will tr try to wiggle your way out of growth subconsciously or consciously because it is uncomfortable and it requires facing this darkness. And sometimes we don't feel equipped to, to deal with that. So sometimes we'll try to figure out an easier way just because that's how, what the brain does. And so there's a relieving component to feeling cornered because you stop running away from what's good for you. It's like almost your, your mother is chasing you around the house trying to give you medicine. And instead of running away from the medicine because it tastes bitter, you're like, all right, I'm just going to I'm going to stop here and I'm going to let my mom give me that bitter medicine because otherwise. I'm gonna be and, and so it, oftentimes being forced to face our shadow helps us in the long run, even if it feels like eating bitter medicine in the short run. And, and so I, I really like that element of facing your own projection that you mentioned too, because oftentimes a lot of the judgment that we cast on other people, as we were talking about earlier, is really, it, it's rooted from us and things that we haven't fully processed. Because if we are truly viewing the situation objectively, then we wouldn't be judging it because it's just a piece of information and understanding. And we're like, oh, we understand that more. But when we place a judgment on something, it is because we're projecting something negative onto it. And that probably stems from something within us and how we view things. And so everything negative is a source of possible reflection onto how we sort things in our mind and how we process things. And Carl Jung talks about that concept all the time too. He talks about how if you see something negative in someone else, it's a means to look more into yourself, which you so wonderfully described, Nancy. And so the next question is, did someone call you cold before? I'm an INFP nine and they say that a lot to me. I do remember an event <clears throat> where, um, and this was a, a woman that I grew up with actually. Um, and we were at a park and I don't know what the interaction that started was, but she, I remember her just stamping her foot and saying, something about you're you're cold you're just so cold and it was just a, an incredible shock to me and temporarily ended our relationship not the remark just the you know interaction period um but i i'll never forget it of course and, you know, I, what I would say to this person, Eva, is that that is um, what, I, what I've learned to do is to, to say the word that I got from John Beebe at a um, conference that he, not a conference, but a workshop he did on 
the feeling function. And he especially focused on FIs and he said, you're processing. So I now tell people, I'm listening to you. And if I don't, if it doesn't show on my face, it's because I'm processing. It's not that I'm not listening. It's not that I don't care about you. And so that has allowed me to stay back there where I need to be in order to maybe hear something that's kind of hurting me or hear, hear something that, you know, is unpleasant or, or to receive something some new information that's put in a way that's unfamiliar to me and that I have to consider. Um, uh, I, I've, I'm not for it. I'm not against it. I, I need to just keep listening. It really, really helps with the relationship. And that, I think that's something, too, I'm realizing. You, FIs need to realize that relationships are very important for them. And that um, they don't always feel welcome. <laughs> you know, you're in your deep FI place doing something or trying to get something done and interrupted by somebody more extroverted or needy physically. But you need those. You need those interruptions. You otherwise would become sterile because you, you must have that that interruption that any stuff come to your door, come to your tent and throw it in, you know, just who didn't even have to look up from your desk. No, I say you do have to look up from your desk and say, thank you, come on in. <laughs> even if it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Once they get in, you'll really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. How do people perceive you? Yeah. I People are often afraid of me. And I, I'm just realizing that lately. And um, I, I don't think of myself as being intimidating. Um, so I, that's, I, I do think uh, that you know, John Beebe's also said about FI is that they are the type that is the most in touch with power. And I think he means that in the sense of they are always on the pulse of the power in the room and um, that they know they can analyze how that power is being expressed or conveyed uh, and they can spot the weaknesses in that way that it's being conveyed um, and that at some level people pick up on that I can't help it see you know like Joyce today she is very very powerful but look what she's doing to, she's using that power for something that I consider a greater good. And so there's no, there's no friction here. There's no power um, play or struggle. Oh, that's so sweet. I loved how you turned up into a compliment. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So it seems like what, you're conveying is FI is very sensitive to injustice in the sense that it notices when power structures, you have someone really high in power who uses their power in the not so good way. And so that can be like, ah, can step on a value very easily. And so the last question we have is any advice for an INFP stuck in an FI SI loop? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Do you mean like the uh, first and third function? Yeah, so I'll add some clarification to this. So it's when you're in a space where you're being very introverted. So you're forgetting about your extroverted functions. You're like, by any, by TE, I'm going to be stuck in this 
extremely hermit, extremely reclusive, extremely taking out the outer world state and in my own head all the time. How do you get out of being too much in your own head? I can relate that to the last uh, last part of the last job that I had. Um, and of course, I didn't even see it that way. But now that you put that in front of me, I can see that where uh, there was so much power and it was hiding the purpose of it. I, I will never really know the purpose of it. Um, but where I just was more and more and more and more thrown in on myself for answers and there weren't any answers. Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about this, you getting yourself into this or, but, or if you're in a situation where, you know, power is being deliberately removed from you, including the reason for it. And um, it, that's, that's what you might call crazy. <laughs> But um, I don't know that seeing a therapist at that point is exactly capable of, you know, taking you out of it. Um, if, if I were your friend, I would just hug you and, you know, bring you back to your body and, um, and say, this too shall pass. Um, it's, it's situational. It's a defense against an impossible, um, you're in a double bind. You're in a double bind. And now you can see what, where that would, unequal power that's not even explained to you, or it, that's not transparent in any way. Yeah, well put. And another way to get out of the loop is to try to escape sameness. So try to do something that is different from the same old, same old, if you are in a loop. Try to figure out a way to step out of your comfort zone, to do something that stretches you a little bit. Um, maybe having a friend drag you out of your head a little bit, drag you into a fun space. Um, to have a place where you can be a little bit goofy, where you can use your imagination more, a creative outlet. So finding a very, very good creative outlet uh, could also help too. And so thank you, Nancy, for coming out. You have a very soft and gentle demeanor and aura, and that exudes the natural kindness within your soul. So you emanate a soft but very strong, kind, and very virtuous spirit. So thank you for that. You have a very amazing, very amazing way of articulating yourself. You include a lot of past experiences and you have all of these possibilities that you give us on how, how you interpret the questions. And so I love that. And you have a very good acquaintance with John Beebe's eight function model. And <laughs> so that is a really amazing quirk. And that partially comes from being a part of Sacramento's Association of Psychological Type. Um, and so I'll just give this <laughs> another go at the Association of Psychological Type is holding a winter conference with John Beebe, the creator of the eight function model and Dario Nardi, the brain scanner of brains for type. So if you'd like to see that, I'll include the registration link once we finish this chat. But yeah, thank you, Nancy, for your amazing dream interpretation skills. We'll be having some panels about how different types will just be describing their dreams. And there may be a correlation to type and there may not be, but it'll be fun to talk about the depth that exists within our subconscious in the form of our dreams. And so stay oh, tuned for that. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> and yeah, thank you everyone for asking your amazing questions. Yeah. And I love you all. And I appreciate everyone who I invite on my show and my audience members who are reoccurring. They're like family to me. 
And so thanks for being that type of family in my life, my, my type family. And so, <laughs> 